first uh, webinar um, entitled There's No Place Like Home, Cities Making Sustainable Living a Reality. Um, just a, a few short housekeeping um, uh, information. So the, your audio right now is currently muted. And if you have any questions, there is a question box where you can um, ask your questions. And we have a specific session for this later in later during the webinar. Um, also, uh, we will be trying our best to also uh, answer your questions as a, in the follow-up, and we will be sending the material for the webinar um, after the webinar has finished. And so, uh, without any further ado, I would like to uh, hand the floor over to uh, Ms. Garrett Clark, um, handling the sustainable lifestyles at this, uh, this uh, UN, UN Environment Program. On to you, Garrett. Thank you. <clears throat> Can we have the next slide, please? <clears throat> Thank you, Andre and Camille, for hosting the webinar today. And I am so delighted to be here. I'm the United Nations Environment Program Sustainable Lifestyles Program Officer. And after making a few introductory remarks about how this webinar fits into the broader series of which it's in, I'm going to hand over to Kirsten Miller from EcoCity Builders who's a partner on actually two webinars that we're doing, who's gonna to be today's master of ceremonies. <clears throat> so could I have the next slide, please? So today's webinar, as I mentioned, is the second in a broader series called Sustainable Living 1.5, Empowering People to Live Better and Lighter. Now, let me give you a little context around sustainable living. So even pre-COVID-19, there had been an increase in media, whether it was online, physical, with colleagues around the world, about how we could live differently, how we could live lighter and have less impact on the planet and our, our context around us. Whether it was about eating or whether it was about how we're moving, there was a, a rethinking about how we could do things differently. Now with COVID-19, this increase in how we live has skyrocketed, albeit it's more about health, well-being, recognizing that many are, are, are understandably in situations of survival. But you know, the reality is we don't really need media to tell us that people have been affected and are changing how they're living in this unprecedented time. We are actually part of that story. We've been exchanging with family, friends, colleagues about how we're doing things, how we're doing things differently, what's working, what isn't, and what's really important to us. And probably at any time in the world, we have never had a better global picture about how people are living and struggling and sharing. Um, we've also seen an underpinning story of the connections between COVID-19 and sustainability whether it's climate, biodiversity, or how we're living in an urban context. And we've seen that there's a huge potential to harness some of this imperative for change, for sustainability. So in essence, many people around the globe are re-examining how we live and questioning how we can emerge as a healthy, resilient, and prosperous society. And the reality is we're not just looking at the healthcare or wellness systems around us, but we're looking at all those interlinked systems that meet our needs around food, mobility, housing, leisure, and how we can enable ourselves to, to live our lives better. And that includes the choice of work, education, how we play, the importance of family, well-being. And let's remember that for many, these, are, these basic issues around needs are posing increasing challenges. Now, I mention this sort of broader context because many of us who work in sustainability, the reality is we work in a sort of constrained jargon or understanding, which we're all very familiar with, whether we're talking about resource flows, around energy, water, if we're looking at environmental impacts, whether it's biodiversity or climate change, or weight. Within this sustainability context, we're very familiar with these, these trends and these systems. But average people, the people who wake up in the morning, don't think about sustainability. 
Now, they don't wake up to hurt the environment, but they don't wake up to help the environment either. And what we're noticing now with the huge increase in connectivity and the impacts that we have in our daily decisions is we have to find a way to harness the energy behind our basic decision making for sustainability. And this sort of effort is considered something around people centric approaches. Now, for those of us who work in sustainability, I'm hoping some of this is not new. If it's something that hearing about a people lens is new, you're getting at the reason behind we're hosting this webinar series, which is looking at sustainability through a people lens. So the 10 webinars that we're doing are going to look at some of the core issues about basically what is sustainable living and how that works. We're going to be looking at deep dives in living sectors, celebrating champions and new policy wildcards. We've all seen youth activists and influencers who not only are important on the sustainability context, but when you look at how basic behavior around COVID-19 issues was handled, it was through a lot of these enabling cultural influencers. We're also going to be looking at available tools and resources. So this overall series isn't done with just one partner because we're all very different and we have a lot of energy and expertise to contribute to the topic area, but it's done with many partners. Today we have EcoCity Builders. In general, we also work with the One Planet Network, which has a number of programs, including the Sustainable Building and Constructions Program that covers and supports the lifestyle areas. Now, we know you have a lot of webinar choices to choose from. And so we're really delighted that you've chosen your morning to spend with us or evening. Um, but we'd also like to note that the work that we're doing contributes to other online events in order to provide that people lens for a broader global dialogue. So could I see the next slide, please? Just to give you a sense of what's coming up in August after you enjoy today's webinar, please consider coming back and seeing in August the case for sustainable lifestyles in a COVID-19 context and dispelling myths on sustainability in people. And again, with Eco City Builders, looking at a city lens that keeps textiles close to home for better and lighter living. So here at the bottom is a link to where you can find out more about the overall series. And I'll post that into the chat area. But with that, I'd like to close these opening remarks and turn it over to Kirsten and let her handle as Master of Ceremonies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Garrett. Appreciate that uh, introduction. And I am also delighted to see everybody here on the webinar today. Um, I'm Kirsten Miller. I'm Executive Director for Eco City Builders. We're a nonprofit based in the San Francisco Bay Area in California, in the United States. And we've been working um, around issues of sustainable cities and neighborhoods with a real emphasis on a people-centric approach. So engaging citizens in the process of creating uh, healthy cities and neighborhoods. And we really see that cities are the front line uh, when anything good or bad comes um, our way as, as human beings living in uh, habitats that we create, the, our ability to create healthy environments um, really depends on how we organize ourselves um, through neighborhood planning, uh, city planning, and the relationship between the built environment and um, the natural environment. So I'm really uh, excited today to have uh, three very powerful speakers who will be sharing their knowledge, um, their, their knowledge and insights from a practitioner perspective, and then also touching on some really uh, concrete examples that go back into deep history in some cases of, of cultures of city builders who have very uh, powerful and important examples of sustainability uh, in the built environment and through a cultural context as well of sustainable living. 
Um, I also want to um, introduce Sharon Gill, a colleague from UN Environment and the Cities Unit, and she will be wrapping up and then um, guiding the question and answer portion. So please, um, when you're listening to the speakers, will you please jot down your questions because we're going to keep to the time limit, so we definitely have enough time for all of us to have a dialogue um, and answer your questions after uh, the speakers. So I'm going to introduce the first speaker now, uh, Serge Salat. He is with the Urban Morphology Institute and UNEP, and he is going to share with us insights on urban form design and planning for sustainable cities. So Serge, could you please um, take over the, the stage here? Okay, thank you. thank you, Justin. Thank you, thank you. And thank you, Garrett, also for uh, putting the topic in the, uh, in the general framework of what is our life uh, 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 with COVID and after COVID. And I, I also helped me to realize why I've put the emphasis on some parts when preparing this presentation. So basically, I will um, elaborate upon uh, a guidelines we are preparing with the uh, UN Environment Cities Unit, Integrated Guidelines for Sustainable Neighborhood Design. Can I have the next one, please? Andre. Okay, so uh, we have three key messages. Uh, local context is key. Uh, uh, any all neighborhoods are different, you know. Uh, not only neighborhoods from the Philippines to Nepal, but also uh, neighborhoods within um, uh, within different Italian cities. And yesterday I had a discussion about people who want to create something in um, in the Middle East, uh, which would uh, uh, look like a Paris. Uh, and I would say, which Paris? Uh, because we have so many different neighborhoods in Paris with different flavors, different people, uh, different uh, um, uh, different atmospheres, different histories dating back uh, one uh, one uh, uh, one millennium ago. Uh, so you cannot say there is something like Paris. But there is there is 120 neighborhoods uh, within the uh, uh, um, uh, historical Paris area. Uh, not even including the uh, the suburbs. So local context is really key. And in local context, uh, I will elaborate more. Then design is really essential. Uh, you can you can provide very different experiences, very different qualities of life, uh, depending on design. And design, I don't mean necessarily master planning of a new place. Just any architect designing one single building as a responsibility to the community, as a responsibility to make his building uh, improve the uh, outside space climatically, so uh, socially, uh, to create public realm. You can do it even with uh, it's called acupuncture uh, uh, architecture and interventions. So it's not just about uh, making big, huge, uh, impressive master plans. And then integration is absolutely essential. Integration of design and system, integration between systems, circular economy and loops. Can I have the next one, please? Okay, local context is key. Uh, urban development is built on land and land form that are unique to their location and in, in two cultures, which are unique to their location. Something fascinating also about uh, Nepal and um, that you have Lalitpur and Kathmandu. You have two uh, royal places, two royal squares, the Durba Square. The Durba Square in Lalitpur is five kilometers from the Durba Square in uh, Kathmandu. And those were two different kingdoms. Uh, with uh, uh, subtle differences uh, in the architecture, lifestyle, and they've been struggling uh, against each other for uh, for centuries, uh, uh, trying to. So you see, these micro differences uh, in 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 the context are, are are super important. Another aspect about the which is uh, often neglected is time. You know, uh, the, the the context changes every hour of the day, uh, uh, changes according to the seasons. And something which is really great in Japan is that you feel the, uh, the you feel the seasons very strongly. Uh, you feel the uh, you feel the hours of the day very very very, very strongly. Uh, and this is also important. Design is not just about building things; it's about uh, building environments where people feel connected to nature through time and through the variation uh, uh, in time. Can I have the next one, please? Okay, integration is essential. 
Uh, so, how to do it, you need to establish interdisciplinary planning teams. Uh, you need to bring people together and people together to work, to work also with the community. It's not just a technical thing. You should really, inter integration is not just a theme, it's not just a, technic a technical theme to reduce the resource use. And then, next one, please, Andre. Design is critical. And as I have said, as I've said, the quality of places we live has an impact on all aspects of life. Uh, and influences not only all aspects of the city, but all aspects of our uh, daily lives. So, uh, next one, please. And this has a very strong impact. This is derived from uh, uh, an analysis about buildings that is true about any urban project. Uh, uh, when you work at design stage, uh, you can really work on optimizing the costs and optimizing the benefits for uh, the environment and the people. And the more you progress into design, construction, even detailed design, you have much less flexibility. Uh, and then into operation of the buildings and then into demolition. And the change potential decreases constantly and the cost for change uh, really increase. So uh, the first stage, the conceptual design of anything, uh, is a, absolutely a critical stage for making it good or making it bad and, 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 and wrong for life of the people. Next one, please. Okay, so what is this uh, uh, basic ideas? And uh, it's create places for people. This is really the, one of the key things. Enrich the existing. Uh, all of the, 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 uh, from the very beginning of the uh, 20th century, uh, architects have been uh, like Le Corbusier, like, you know, people want to change everything and destroy and eradicate. And uh, so the task of the architect was to wiping out uh, everything which was existing. And uh, what we want is exactly the opposite, is to enrich the existing, uh, to bring value to the existing, to weave new things into the existing context, not destroy the existing context. Uh, make connections. Connections are essential. Physical connections, connections between people, work with the landscape, mixed uses and forms. And mixing use is okay. Oh, mixed use, mixed use, mixed use, okay. But mixed use is not just about uh, having different uses at the same place. You need to have also different forms and you need to have a variety of forms uh, to be able to accommodate uh, um, a lot of variation into uses. Target carbon neutrality, of course, with innovative designs. Close the loops. Uh, this is a theme of circular economy and design for change, because neighborhoods and cities are constantly changing, constantly evolving, uh, like societies. And if they are rigidly designed and planned, they will not be able to uh, evolve. Next one, please. Next one, Andre. Yeah. So first, it may look quite complicated because design is something where you should ensure privacy and access, ground floor, semi-outdoor space, urban window, pocket garden, roof urban agriculture, step building height, solar panel installation, integrated community blocks. So you have all this coming together. So how to organize it? Uh, next slide, please. What I do when I do projects, and don't worry, I'm not going to make a course in, 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 in design there, I'm just going to focus on some key messages. We can work in layers, you know, a green and blue layer, which you see there. Then uh, you have a mobility layer, sustainable mobility. Then you have the land use, then you have the public space. But then when you see at these uh, graphics, you realize immediately that they are not uh, uh, considered separately. They are considered into layers that interact. And in a sense, this is a way to create order in developing a project while creating integration. And this is exactly, this, these four graphs are exactly the opposite of working in silos. Working in silos meaning that you will have on one side uh, transportation planners and another side uh, uh, land planners making demographic things and another side uh, green landscape architects. And an interesting thing also is that very good projects developed in the UK quite recently start by the landscape, the green and blue layer. You first create a, a landscape and then you start to, to make connections in, in, into it. Uh, a weave movement lines for people, a pedestrian movement lines. Not just you don't think about cars, you make movement lines across the landscape. And then you start to define uh, where uh, all, all the different uses are going to weave uh, uh, together and, and you create the public space. Uh, so uh, in this order, adding layer upon layer to a project, you ensure integration instead of uh, thinking thinking in silos. Uh, second one, uh, next one, please. Okay, so design from context. This is a picture I took in Lalitpur in Nepal. 
so and 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 context is not just the physical. It's totally fascinating the, the way the, the, the Nepalese tied ropes uh, around trees. Uh, the Japanese also tied ropes around trees. And I'm still trying to figure out. I, I know I know quite well how, uh, what what is the meaning in in in, in Japan. It's creating a sacred area because uh, all nature is sacred in Japan. I'm still trying to figure out uh, what 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 this meaning in in Nepal. But I think if I have the opportunity to come back and work with the Nepalese, uh, this is this is absolutely context. You don't have a tree. A tree is not just a physical object of nature. It's also a cultural object in many cultures. And when you stop considering a tree as a cultural sacred object, uh, you, you start to, to lose the connection with nature. Connection with nature is not just uh, like enjoying a forest. Uh, 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 it's just like uh, uh, it's a cultural it's a cultural thing. It's a cultural approach. So design for resilience and evolution. Next one, please. I, I, I will not have time to, to detail these uh, uh, qualities of resilience, but just let, let's, let's look at modularity and just look at uh, uh, layering of, uh, of things and flexibility. This is a map of Firenze in, in the uh, Santa Croce uh, neighborhood or district. And then you see the, um, the, the, the form of, uh, actually I don't have the, uh, just in front of the, of the square, uh, before arriving to the church, you have a uh, uh, oval form, and this is a Roman amphitheater. So, meaning what? Meaning that this area has been evolving uh, for 2,000 years, uh, and and you you have this modularity, you have this fine grain, and of course, these houses have started to uh, fill in the Roman amphitheater and the circular uh, street around uh, is, is the surrounding of the Roman amphitheater. This is a great success in terms of resilience and evolution, this capacity to evolve. Next one, please. Another example, which I'm not going to detail, is modularity. This is a way Chinese people have been building cities for 5,000 years uh, into a modular plan, uh, gridded, uh, no, not the, the, this one, uh, gridded uh, with the Sahayuan houses, and then you see a neighborhood, uh, and you see houses there, which is quadrangle houses built around a courtyard, but it's not a house around the courtyard, it's four pavilions around the courtyard, open in the corner. It's extraordinary in terms of uh, bioclimatic uh, uh, adaptation and capacity. I will, I will show you more later on. And this is modular. And unfortunately, now, instead of growing modularly, they make these big uh, buildings. Uh, and this was also as a higher density, only with one, one uh, or two floors high than uh, huge tall buildings that we build today. Next one, please. Okay, this I will, I will move, next one. Next one, next one, okay. This is on the left-hand side, no, no, the first, the, the first one, please. On the first, uh, uh, on, on the left-hand side, what should not be done, uh, the segregation of uh, uh, uses around, uh, uh, and this is unfortunately what is usually done. And on the right side, this is what is a neighborhood, where you have two main streets, you have the center, which is dance in, in activity, and you have, and then next one, please. Uh, yeah, next one. You find this in Patan, Lalipur, because you have two axes, you have the stupa in each, uh, at each extremity of the axis, and then in the middle, you have the double square, which is the most uh, intense uh, place, uh, combining both uh, sacred and religion and combining both uh, uh, local power. So this is a generic universal. So at the same time, you, it's totally different uh, structure as any uh, uh, a Roman uh, Empire city, but it shares uh, culturally and uh, for everything, but it shares this very clear human organization where you have two axes corresponding to the uh, cardinal points because north, south, east, west is a very strong meaning uh, in terms of religion, in terms of uh, bioclimatic properties and you have activity at the center and you have uh, entry points at each uh, cardinal direction. Next one, please. Okay, so I have just five minutes now. <laughs> Connect people, movement and street patterns. So then uh, when you, uh, first you, you, when you have started to, to figure out the general structure, uh, and and you, you you start to create you start to connect and connecting will create the blocks next one please and then yeah please next one next, uh, uh, click 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 on again uh, this is a project in London where they applied it 
uh, just connecting, creating 20 new streets. Don't hesitate to create new streets. Actually, you you, you will you will never connect enough <laughs> the neighborhood to the uh, uh, nearest place. Actually, there is a very huge deficit in terms of meaning create streets, meaning not creating huge wide roads, meaning create narrow streets, narrow lanes, a variety of uh, narrow streets uh, for people to walk uh, for or, or to bike. Okay, next one, please. And the shape factors of the streets, I have no time to elaborate here, yeah, this one, are really important because if the street, and also bioclimatically and for the people feeling, the people experience, if the street is narrow and tall, first the light is not getting into the street, which is very good, basically in hot and arid climates, and even in, uh, in, in, in humid climates, you should enlarge more to keep the wind. But, uh, and also when you have one-to-one, -one, the height similar to the width, uh, you create a feeling of uh, defining defining the street, okay? And when it is narrow, you get the feeling of enclosure. But when it gets really wide like this, uh, with low buildings on, on the right of the, of the graph, you lose the enclosure, you lose the definition of the street, and you lose the human relationship to the, to the, to the street. Next one, please. I have no time to, 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 to show that much, but the street is just like an history. It's just like a story. Uh, making walkable cities is not just making, it's not just a technical thing. It's just creating a, an adventure of discovery for the street with anticipation, turning, movements, and uh, no time to, but I, I will share this point with you, uh, framing and discovery. And the interesting thing, this has been done with Italian cities, but if we move to the next slide, uh, we see this in traditional uh, Chinese uh, water towns. Uh, so this is also something universal. Good cities, good walking cities, provide the human experience when walking in the street. Next one, please. Wow, I have no time. Design the public realm. Uh, this is really interesting. The public realm should be something defined with walls. It should be a room. Uh, it should be an outdoor room. It should not be like, uh, not defined like in Brasilia around. Next next one, please. I will jump through the next one. Okay, next one. Okay, and this is a project I am not going to explain in, in uh, contemporary one. I just want not only to talk to history, but it has been designed like this. Okay, next one, next one, next one, okay. So next one, okay. So the block designed with blocks, okay. This you can use with uh, for um, next one. This not not this one. Next one, uh, okay. For you can design with blocks for, and this is Amalbi Shostad, which has been inspired by the typology of blocks of inner uh, city of Stockholm, uh, but the blocks have been reopened and designed, developed with fine grained parcels and plots, uh, and then you see terms. Uh, next one, please. Something dramatic in. Next one, in American cities, that the plots which are on originally small ones on the left-hand side have been consolidated, consolidated into big blocks uh, with uh, uh, much less flexibility. And in Japan, interestingly, is uh, opposite movement. The, the plot pattern is uh, um, uh, making smaller and smaller plots. Okay, next one, design with nature. I will try to make it in two minutes. Next one, next one, next one, next one, next one, next one. Okay, yeah. This I have been showing now the previous one, please, the previous one, the previous one. Okay, I've been showing you the Sakha the, Yuan, the, the Chinese uh, uh, square house, and you see that according to the climates, uh, it's totally changing from north to south according to the latitude, uh, more open and more uh, wide uh, in the north, and then uh, smaller courtyards in the south incorporating a lot of gray space, space in between, ventilated naturally but outdoors. And you could make exactly the same story in Europe, uh, uh, except that we will move towards uh, hot and arid climates in the south in North Africa. Next one. A strategy for tropical climates. So this is where we're going to move quite fast. Uh, uh, next one, next one, next one. Please, okay. Maximize wind within sight. This is some things we will find in, in the guideline. Next one, please. Next one, next one. I, I, I really want next one, next one. Okay. Yeah, okay. This is interesting. Weaving a green through the urban fabric. But also, next one. Weaving green. Through the building, this is in uh, Singapore, and you can have this type of projects in in, in Philippines as well. Uh, it's a kampung. It's a rec reconstitution of a village, so it is social at the same time. We have healthcare facilities, uh, um, a food court on, on entirely one level. You have uh, uh, housing, and 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 you have green on on the and next one, please. So you see, next one is green uh, more than one hundred percent. 
So meaning that uh, you have more green than the original uh, surface of the land. And next one. And, it, and this, is, you see in the middle, is the fourth floor. This is experience at the fourth floor. So you have weaved in three dimensions green through your building. Next one, please. Okay, and you can apply the same type of principles to zero energy buildings to open them and to make them cross by the flows of air in tropical climates. Next one. Next one. Oh, okay, and I will wrap up on the strategic density. Yeah. Okay. Usually we think about density as something really hopeful with uh, like a Hong Kong with buildings clustered together. Actually, no. Uh, strategic density. This is on the on the on the uh, right hand side. Amarbi Shostad which I have been on the typology of the inner blocks of Stockholm, but even recreated in a, in a modern way, in a contemporary way with relationship with nature. And this is 15,000 uh, people per square kilometer plus 7,500 uh, people. It's uh, uh, three quarters of the density of central Paris or the density of Manhattan. Uh, and you see that with good design, you can achieve integration at all scales with nature. And this is what we mean by high density. We don't mean something else. Next one, please. Next one. Okay, Serge, there is no place. Your time oh, is I, up. I, I, okay. I wrap up in one minute. I wrap up in okay, one minute. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Okay. This, this is my home. Okay. So you <laughs> see during the COVID. So <laughs> right in the center of Paris. So if you can provide these piece, patches of nature, small ones to people. Next one. I, I'm really wrapping up on a few pictures. Next one. Okay. This is a city which is one of the densest in the world, uh, 100,000 people per square kilometer, five times more dense than Manhattan. And this is Venice, actually. And it is super green within. Uh, uh, believe me, this was my home in Venice. And not in, in, the, in the suburbs of Venice. This was my home in Dossodur, right in the middle of Venice. And a few slides to, to finish on this theme of articulated density, and I will, I will stop there. Next one, please. Okay, yeah, you see the type of life high density can provide with a gradation between uh, public space, private space. The idea is to, to weave nature at micro scales. Next one. Yeah, and so smart densification is about uh, infill, weaving nature, intensifying the green and intensifying the build form uh, in a way that you maximize solar rights, you maximize wind. Next one, I finish on that. I think it's finished there. Next one. That's it. Next one. Okay, so this was the other theme. So I have finished that. So the key message okay. is you can provide a super high quality of living by weaving at micro scales uh, green and high density. Uh, considering bioclimatic uh, uh, outcomes and cultural uh, meaning. That's something which ha happens in the uh, Kampung uh, I, I've been showing, the contemporary Kampung I've been showing in uh, Singapore. Sorry for the... Thank you, Serge. No, thank you very much for your presentation. And um, will we be making these presentations available for uh, attendees and also uh, you know, speakers, because I would love to review it. Serge, I don't know if you'll give permission, but um, yes, yes. fascinating. Thank you so much. So I would like to move on to our next speaker. And I'd like to introduce Pradeep Amaitya. He's from Lalitpur, Metropolitan City. Um, he is going to share some of the uh, projects and activities that the city of Lalitpur in Nepal, neighbor of Kathmandu, is undertaking to um, strengthen a urban form that is very sophisticated and goes back deep into time and is really based on a traditional urban form that has uh, excellence and a lot of uh, knowledge that is very helpful for, uh, for us today in the modern world. So Pradeep, uh, thank you for joining us and uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Christine. Uh, today I am going to present about a traditional urban design in making a sustainable lifestyle. What uh, we, not we, it's, uh, our ancestors did, 
but uh, we have to preserve this one. So next. Andre. Uh, today I have uh, two, three contents uh, I prepare. Uh, the first uh, introduction of Lalipu. Uh, it is uh, Lalipu is one of the vibrant city in Kathmandu Valley, and it is uh, literally actually literally means it is a city of fine arts. In Kathmandu, you can see many temples. Uh, that is uh, already Salat has already shown some of the slides. So we are culturally rich, we believe, and uh, it's a uh, 36th craft city in the world uh, city craft. And its area is about uh, 36 kilometer. And in Kathmandu, you, you can see uh, many temples. Next. Andre. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, in collaboration with uh, Eco City Builders, uh, we did some of the uh, issues, like uh, some of the things we, like uh, Lalitpur is a uh, old city. It is uh, 1720 years old city and it has lots of possibilities. Uh, Nepal is focused on making a smart city these days and it is quite popular word these days. All the mayors wants to make a city, smart city, but uh, it is not clear. Uh, uh, some some of the uh, smart city, uh, city is like Bungamati and Kokna is in Lalitpur. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, actually, our city is designed uh, in a traditional way. Uh, it's an old city, so. Actually, Newar people uh, live. Newar people want to live nearby their site uh, in the community they want. Uh, so uh, most of the houses uh, are established in such a way that uh, some open space are there, water availability, and groundwater recharge, and inclusive uh, since uh, very beginning. And the house are built uh, within the periphery of a courtyard in Lalipur. Most of the houses are follow the traditional patterns. These courtyards allows uh, for greater solar penetrations into the homes uh, and never houses were not permitted to exceed the heights of nearby temples. That is the standard. So uh, they cannot build a more uh, height than temple and it is about 1.6 to 1.9 meters. This low ceiling height allows the room to be uh, heated more easily during the winter. And the walls of never houses are constructed from the sun right and the floor and ceiling consist of timber frame. Next, please. So I have many slides, so maybe it makes take, take 15 minutes. So I want to skip more things. Uh, the typical design of the houses are like uh, for, for the COVID also. We can see uh, we Nepal in uh, it is uh, made as a quarantine. Like no, uh, so some of the houses uh, we, when we go into the uh, our houses, old house, then we have to drop our uh, shoes outside the house and uh, our toilet used to be outside and our kitchen uh, should be in the top floor, uh, on top floor and uh, we used to put a guest in the a ground floor so in that in that way also we we are we we just put our uh, make a house like this and the staircase is usually a single flight to one side of the plane uh, and the first floor consists of a bedroom while the con Second floor, house main living. In that way, uh, and the third floor, we have a uh, boiga that has a kitchen with open fireplace. By placing the kitchen at the top of the house, the bedroom and living room areas are prevented from the overheated in the summer. In this way, uh, the old house is made. So our lifestyle is a little bit different from the European and others. Next, please. Also, we in a sustainable lifestyle, we want to con consider uh, the uh, five elements uh, we believe in the Nepal, like Dr. Sudarshan Tiwari also used to mention this thing, like sky, fire, art, water, and air. And uh, also, Nepal is highly possibility of uh, uh, eight hours potential in solar lights. So during the winter and the during summer. So we want to make a sustainable features in uh, uh, this during the uh, building of new buildings. And also we are promoting some greenhouses in Lalitpur. Like uh, they have to use the uh, green materials, locally available materials, and uh, some solar panels, solar uh, energy efficient building, 
and rainwater harvesting. In that way, we are trying to develop our, and the big stelia are used in thermal insulation. Roofs are used uh, for thermal insulation and also a thermal mass is used. Next, please. Next. And uh, this is a uh, Nevari community uh, it's a, of Nag Bahal and uh, the place uh, it's in Ward 16. There you can see that all the houses are is, is uh, in a community and uh, most of the houses have penetrated for the solar lights and uh, settlement structure are inclined to as a modern lifestyle and uh, environment friendly lifestyle is there stone paved and clean courtyards which uh, percolates the rainwater and result in groundwater recharge and spacious green land with a vegetation with the uh, precious clean years next please Yeah, with, uh, we, see, we did some of the EcoCity pilot project initiations in, uh, recently in uh, December 2019. And uh, some roundtable uh, meetings uh, was held with uh, 18 mayors of Kafarno Valley. Next, please. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Yes, steps for ecocity planning we did like we did um, uh, uh, ecocity framework for the country regional context and convened round table of re uh, relevant actors developed design guiding guidelines and some and uh, we did a uh, meeting with the mayor forum and in in that way uh, some of the steps we did for environment ecocity planning next please Next, please. Uh, some of the outcomes of the um, this assessment we did. Next, this is uh, because time is limited. So, next slide, please. Next, uh, another one. Next, please. Next and another next. This is just a we we did some some of the uh, physical study in that area. And we have uh, st some steps to make a eco city. Like uh, we have included our construction building construction in a building course. Some construction of cycle lanes been developed in Lalitpur, and uh, electrical vehicles been promoted. And some smart solar lights and intelligent traffic signal is in the road going to be installed. And roadside plantations, open space management, revival of uh, traditional water supply system, uh, promoting urban agriculture through rooftop gardening. In this way, we have done some initiated uh, for eco city and traditional water supply systems. We have a, a typical type of water supply system in the Lalitpur city. We have a, a, a traditional stone spouts are there. Still, it, it is drinkable and it is still some of the water supply system are still functioning. And there is, you can find a 350 uh, public wells from where we can extract uh, water from there. Still, it is uh, functioning well and it is drinkable. And this is Pimbal Pokhri. There are many uh, Pokhris there. That is replicated in the neighbor, uh, neighbor of the Kafandu Valley. Now, now Kafandu is also uh, working for the same model. Next, please. Next, uh, and again, next. Next, please. Yeah, this is uh, some of the ponds being renovated after this three years, after the earthquakes uh, in 2015, many ponds and many uh, this, uh, monuments are uh, damaged and we are we have to revive these things in a uh, traditional way. And uh, so this is very useful for the recharging. Next, please. And this is some ecological restoration. Uh, it has been uh, previously, it was a recharge zone for the all the water spouts, and now it is uh, some enclosement is done, and some uh, this is enclosed by the school, and this is already from the Supreme Court. It is verdict already, and now it is uh, uh, belongs to Lalipur municipality. So this is to be resolved. Uh, this is to be uh, 
meet again. Next, please. Yeah, this is uh, some points that for water research. Next, please. Next, next, yeah, this is uh, some cycle lanes been developed in Lalitpur, and we did uh, some cycle rally. Uh, next, please. And this is the Bagmati River, which is a political boundary of Lalipur and Kathmandu. Similar types of park been in the both side of the river bank. Next, please. This is electrical vehicle. This is promoted now. Uh, some in some, but initiated only some. Uh, but this year our national budget has some. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, waste free lollipop campaigns. So, uh, next, please. Yeah, future plan of Lollipur is like uh, we want to make a beauty, beautify the city, electricity plants, uh, Lollipur plant. We want to construct seven more parks in Lollipur. We are going to install a smart light and uh, we want to ban the plastic bags in Lalipur and some to declaration of some free, uh, car free zone. And uh, uh, the Darwar Square means a palace is in, enlisted in the UNESCO World Heritage Site to operate. Uh, uh, electrical buses in the different routes. Uh, we want to reduce uh, open burning in the city and some development of blue and green project that is initiated by our mayor. And uh, we want to install the intelligent traffic signals in Lalitpur. Next, please. And this is actually, this is the uh, last slide, but uh, some of the, uh, the uh, uh, this is we did with uh, we are planning uh, to uh, we are working with the uh, eco city builders like their four pillars and some 18 indicators we want to include in uh, our city planning because our we we believe our uh, Lalitpur city is already eco city so only we have to preserve these things so uh, we we were hoping uh, to get uh, more support from. Uh, Eco city builders, some technical supports so that we can maintain our city in like urban designing, bio geophysical features, socioculturally, how to uh, encourage the people uh, in the uh, old traditional model like that. Next, please. Yeah, these are the slides of the uh, some of the slides. So uh, this this ends my uh, presentation. Uh, I will try to explain more because uh, we have a limited time and we have many things to say. So, uh, but uh, this access to proximity and the safe, affordable housing, green buildings are some of the good things that can be uh, utilized in Lalitpur. We can as we can do many things with, with the support from eco city builders. So this is my presentation. Any, if any question arises, I will be ready to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pradeep. Um, there's so much to learn from Nepal and Lalitpur city in particular, and um, the all of the members of Eco City Builders have always been fascinated with uh, the Kathmandu Valley and the cities there. So uh, there's so much to learn, and I think as everyone probably noticed from Pradeep's presentation, um, there's so much that's already um, smart in a context that's very sophisticated as far as urban planning and design. And then as you can see with um, the current administration there in the city, they're doing so many things all at once. And I, from experience, I know that uh, Pradeep, you are really making a lot of these things happen. So I, it's, uh, if anybody, has questions about how to get things done, then please um, send Pradeep a, an email because he's 
he's really helping to implement all of the EcoCity plans of Lalitpur. Um, so thank you, Pradeep. And then I'd like to move on to our final, last but not least at all, there's Veronica Hitosis. Uh, she's with the League of Cities of the Philippines. And um, I'd like to just hand it right over to you, Veronica, for your presentation. And thank you so much for, for joining us today. Yeah, hi, thank you, Kristen. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna make the presentation without video on my end so you can focus on the slide. And I'm thinner there, so I think that's okay. a better. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sounds okay, good. so yeah. So um good morning to everyone. Very early morning to Kirsten. Um and uh, good afternoon to our friends from this side of the globe. Um today I will share with you the imperatives of making our city sustainable and and how um, using our evolving experience uh, from COVID-19. So in the next next slide, uh, you will see, yeah, it's delayed because it's Manila. So I think it will take longer to load. But in the next slide, <laughs> um, you will see that COVID-19 cases in the Philippines um, has gone up. So it's very sad that I'm sharing uh, this presentation with you. And just yesterday, we have uh, recorded the highest number of cases in a day at 2,400 plus. Mm -hmm. But the, in the next slide that you will see, um, the the per, it was it was a June 30 uh, report. And as of June 30, 61% of the reported cases are found in cities. And uh, the top two regions are in NCR, where I am. That's why I'm staying home. <laughs> and in Central Visayas, where Sharon is from. And uh, what you see in those two regions is that there's a huge um, number of informality. So in the next slide, um, what do these two regions, NCR and Central Visayas, have in common? You will see the number of informal settler families in NCR and Central Visayas. And uh, what this means is that um, according to tw the 2011 data of the national government, almost 40% of the 1.5 million informal settler families live in NCR in Metro Manila, while only 4.23% live in Central Visayas. Also in the next, next slide, um, both regions are rapidly urbanizing. In fact, um, NCR and Central Visayas are in the top five region in terms of level of urbanization. And that's what this slide is showing. So, okay, it's okay, next slide. And um, just to chip in, in the design, I'm a war word person. So um, both regions also um, have been largely influenced by Poblacion or the Spanish, uh, Spanish design towns. Um, this is where the church, the market, and the city is found in one location. Um, but there's another type, same as the Poblacion, but more in an expanded area. But in for Central Visayas and NCR, um, I think it's in the third slide uh, from this slide that I'm seeing. <laughs> yeah, next. Yeah. Um, I think what could explain the the fast spread of COVID-19 is because in, in NCR and Central Visayas, um, it is characterized by a metropolitan site with expanding uh, to neighboring towns. That's why uh, it, both regions recorded high uh, cases of COVID-19. But in the next slide, while we see that cities are the hotspots of COVID-19, um, what we're finding in the League of Cities of the Philippines are cities are also where the solutions are. So in the succeeding slides on the city's responses to COVID-19, if you can just go to that slide, you will see how cities have cautioned the impacts of COVID-19 by ensuring citywide sanitation and physical distancing, ensuring food security, by providing transport, bringing the market closer to the people, and by providing shelter to street dwellers. So in the next slide, um, it, I think it's the picture on your left. 
It shows Davao City conducting disinfection and misting of public markets to reduce transmission of COVID-19. While the picture on the right um, shows a mobile market uh, in Iriga City or that Iriga City set up to enable neighborhoods to have access to fresh produce. So I'll wait for those slides to come up before I move to the next. <laughs> okay. And then so, and then you'll see um, in the city of Kabangkalan, um, which is on the left. Yeah, that, that one. Okay. City of Kabangkalan, um, the city is providing transport service to uh, senior citizens, persons with disabilities, pregnant women to access services because during the lockdown, public transportation has been suspended. And then the picture on your right shows uh, how Manila City is providing temporary shelter to urban street dwellers to combat the spread of COVID-19. Okay. Okay, now on further reflections, not now that I have been working from home, <laughs> I like to believe that I have more time to reflect, but essentially the next three slides will just show you what I have learned from attending various uh, webinars at the comforts of my home. <laughs> So I think first reflection is um, we need to design better cities. And uh, here I think I need to add Serge's uh, presentation on sustainable uh, key aspects of sustainable neighborhood. But this uh, the in the UN Habitat session that I attended, a fellow Filipina who was a panelist mentioned that in responding to the pandemic, uh, inclusive inclusively planners and urban designers have to immerse with slums and formal communities to understand spaces slum typologies and related aspects for transformation this resonates with me because um, in some cities while slums um, have been a breeding ground for the virus contact tracing is made easier in these communities because they know each other help volunteers rely on the knowledge of the neighborhood or communities in finding people that are showing signs or symptoms of COVID-19. And because people live close to each other, they know who has traveled, who's working where, and who have been exposed to the virus. My second reflection is uh, about city visions. Uh, recently, I attended a Senate hearing uh, tackling a bill that seeks to promote sustainable cities and communities. One of the resource persons shared, and again, it resonates with me, and I'm copying it here. Um, because prior to COVID-19 in the Philippines, uh, we just had a volcanic eruption north of Manila. Uh, there's a bushfire happening in Australia, and Kobe Bryant died. So that's very sad. I think we really need to create strategies for symptoms and causes of concurrent crisis to ensure better response from our city governments for the benefit of people living in cities. We can no longer afford to look at it as a consecutive crisis because three really things are happening all at once. And then the last slide is, uh, is my quote. I'm just kidding. I think I just have to weigh in as a political scientist, uh, a political science student. Um, I think leadership or style of governance really play a critical role. And uh, we look at the data, we monitor how city responds to the virus. And while the jury is still out trying to make a verdict on what worked and didn't work, I can already see patterns and trends that are worth noting. Whether you are a new mayor, a mayor who left public service and just came back, a young mayor, an old mayor. I met the mayor of Lalitpur, by the way. He's really very nice. Uh, it really pays to know your city, what it needs, and where the poor are to respond to crisis. We have one city um, in one of the hotspots in NCR where when countries are imposing lockdowns after lockdowns, this new mayor, what this new mayor did was go to the slums or slum community and distribute food packs. And when we asked him why, he said, so that they will not go out. And that really helped in containing the virus. The same mayor pays the hotels because during lockdowns, hotels cannot take in clients. He pays the hotel to house the medical frontliners so that they can 
have they can go to the hospital nearby or have more shifts to attend to the to the people who are suffering from COVID-19. These two responses, while trivial, explain why the number of cases in that city, despite being a region in despite being a hotspot region, is lar is not that huge compared to the top 10 cities in that region. Despite the fact of having large informality, high population density, and massive massive poverty or a higher magnitude of poor people. What the mayor did is that he took what the city has, large informality, all these all this characteristics, and designed responses that work. So to conclude, I mean, to summarize, I think we need to make our cities sustainable because a lot of people live in cities and virus spread easily in cities, you know, simply put. But to do this, we need to take our current design and understand it. I think that's what Serge and the Pradeep were saying earlier. And it is easy to vilify or say informality is bad, you know, um, or is the culprit of the spread of the virus. But as what we have, as, as what our experience have shown, you know, this is also where solutions lie, and uh, and which also helps in containing the virus. And we need. It's also important that we need to prepare our cities for concurrent, not consecutive crisis. And I just want to say, we really need to elect good leaders. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> just a moment ago, science. And we, I, just, I just need to say it out there. So I think that's my presentation, Christine. I take it back to you. Thank you, Veronica, very much uh, for your very thoughtful presentation and your insights uh, someone living in the united states or with a certain kind of government i just take that to heart uh, <laughs> we really need better leadership and um but like you said cities are the front lines and these crises are are concurrent they're they're just they're multiple crises happening at once and I really love how you explained um, understanding your city unlocks the solutions. Um, and, and as you could see from your assessments that the leaders of cities who really understand their, their cities and their communities can help prevent the spread of the virus and deal with these um, crises as they are unfolding. So I thought that was really powerful insights and thank you so much for sharing them. Um, so that concludes our, our three expert panelists uh, for today's webinar. And now we're moving into the discussion um, period, which will be um, prefaced by a few remarks from Sharon Gill from UNEP. And then she will also be moderating the, the questions. So Sharon? Hi, Kirsten. Thank you. Um, uh, I just wanted, I thought the discussion was very interesting. Thank you, Serge, Pradeep, and Varan. Um, yeah, I, I saw three big buckets uh, emerging, and uh, one of them being the, the lessons that we need to learn from older cities and structures. Um, uh, cities like Lalitpur and Venice, as Serge mentioned, this is uh, this is something very interesting, occurring in two different continents. Um, we see the the need to reconnect the relationship between um, nature and people, and how uh, this relationship also helps us as people build better better cities. Um, I also saw, um, I mean, across the three speakers, the need to really uh, create that the people should co-create the city um, understand how people live um, and um, also um, um, including including um, um, ensuring that we take advantage of close relationships even in um, informal communities we have a few questions and um, I really like this discussion because it connects to UNEP's work on the neighborhood approach and how we think that it's important as we move towards a, 
um, a more sustainable environment, we need to create change, not just from the uh, top down, but also from the bottom up. And this is really what we are trying to do here. Um, so I'll start with, with one of the interest, more interesting questions, for which is for all speakers. So um, does the panel think that cities and towns should evolve organically or should be planned? Um, which are more vibrant, planned cities or those that are allowed to evolve, like a kampung or a village? Um, I would uh, ask Serge to start with that. Uh, what are the the balance between planning and, uh, that, that, and that answer is organic? In, the answer is in balance, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's not in balance. It's, it's in succession. Uh, if you look at all these uh, cities we love in Europe, uh, the story is that they originally around the Mediterranean, uh, which is take one example, uh, they have been planned by the Romans with a grid, Cardo and Decumanus and uh, cardinal points and squares, blocks, uh, 70 meters by 70 meters. And then during the Middle Age, they have evolved organically, like Roma was a square grid originally, and then it has evolved organically with paths by, by people, uh, uh, more curved streets and uh, more converging patterns and uh, this type of organic evolution. Grids allow that, basically, to be deformed with time. And then when the grid has been too much deformed, uh, come the Pope uh, uh, in, the, uh, in Roma or uh, the Duke of Savoy in Torino, and they start to create hexes and some monumentality and some uh, higher scale uh, composition overlayered on the uh, too much informal city. Uh, Paris has evolved exactly like that. So uh, you need to consider that uh, you, 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 yeah, but that's something also that's really important in your question is that I have been writing this in some of my papers. The, uh, the planners should create a checkerboard, basically. Checkerboard can be like in Manhattan, uh, a grid of streets, and then uh, you have uh, 130,000 small plots, okay? Then uh, people, the market, communities, neighborhoods, and uh, you have myriads of uh, uh, people which are going to intervene uh, on this checkerboard uh, along the time. And from a uniform checkerboard, seemingly uniform checkerboard, New York Commissioner's Plan in uh, 1811, emerges a city with a huge amount of diversity and with neighborhoods with specific characteristics. And this is brilliant, actually. So, uh, if you, and the Romans were planning like that. They, they were making a plan which would evolve incremental modular uh, transformation over time. And then at some point, uh, you may need, uh, a Manhattan is such a strong plan that it, you, you may not need at the end to regularize that. But if you have Middle Ages for 1,000 years uh, with a big transformation of the urban fabric, you may need some regularization. So, and the problem, uh, to come back to your very precise question, is planning now is super rigid, super functionally oriented. You know, Manhattan has not been planned for any technological optimization. Manhattan has not been planned for cars and has not been planned for skyscrapers. You could not, if not even imagine a skyscraper at the time. There was, electricity was not used. So it has been just planned for having a land use, a small fine grain system of plots to reassemble. Uh, so at the moment, planning is just like, a, it's just an engineering way of creating cities. Yeah, of course, cities should be planned because you, you need to create streets, but streets should not be needed for cars. Uh, streets were originally needed for linking uh, people to people, whatever the technology of linkage, you know. So, uh, so you, you, of course, you, you need planning and design, but this should accommodate technological change and not be informed by technological change and not be so much optimized. That which is the theme of resilience with redundancy, modularity. Resilience is about you. You can create many pathways for for evolving. So, if you are too rigidly optimized. You're not going to create any alternative pathway of, of moving. So that's, of course, we need planning, but we need an entirely different way of planning, and uh, but not so entirely different way, entirely different from the 20th century, engineered, uh, the way we engineered our cities in the 20th century uh, for optimizing car circulation or for optimizing uh, whatever. But we have a long uh, history of planning. You know, Lalitpur is planned in a sense. Uh, it's not, it's not, uh, it's just something, but within yeah. the plan, 
you have the, the courtyard houses, which are assembling organically. So mm -hmm. you, you have also different, different scales, you know. You should have an overall uh, structure, and then at uh, uh, smaller scales, the capability to assemble, the, that's what I've been showing with the Sahayuan in China. But Lalipur is the same thing. The courtyard house has the capability to make many, many different courtyard houses different, uh, with, uh, with belonging to the same ideal type. So you have an organic uh, growth uh, within the plan. And uh, so I, I don't mm. make myself understood, but that, that's not one or the other. But it's not certainly okay. not the way we have been planning uh, during the, the, the 20th century. Okay. But, but we have so, a history of 5,000 years of planning, of good, <laughs> of good city plans, which have evolved, which are still there. No, that's that's very helpful, Serge. Before you um, respond, uh, Veronica and Pradeep, I'd like to add one more question to, to towards each one of you. Um, to Veronica, it's around cycling and Metro Manila. Uh, there have been multiple citizen initiatives to designate a, a bicycle in major highways in Metro Manila. Um, however, such initiatives are met with strict government regulations. How can urban roads be redesigned or repurposed to shift into more sustainable lifestyle that supports cycling? And uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give uh, Pradeep's question as well. Um, uh, we have, uh, we have a, um, one of the attendees asking, um, how is Lalitpur promoting electric vehicles? So um, shall we start with Veronica? Hi, Sharon. Thank you for that question. I think uh, I think that's a planner question more <laughs> than an implementer. Yeah. I think I think in the Philippines, especially in NCR, um, I think that the bicycle lanes are are gaining ground in terms of um, making the roads uh, more bicycle friendly. I think the challenge I think I think the challenge now for legislation and also for implementation is. Um, it really shows how poorly designed the current uh, the current uh, roads that we have uh, in the city, and uh, and then I think that's also where the planned versus uh, organically growing city that Serge was alluding to uh, makes sense. Um, I think there's a strong proposal for that. I think the Metro Manila mayors are also supporting um, at least, especially in the metropolis. But if you've been to the Philippines, I think the challenge now is they're trying to implement it nationwide. And if you've been to the Philippines, the typographical um, characteristics, you have hilly cities, or cities with very um, high elevation. So it's it's difficult to connect the bicycle lanes. I think I think you can you can put it in the city center, but it's hard to put it uh, um, like connect it into a network of bicycle lanes. I think that's the main challenge right now. And and the and the person who asked the question is correct. The regulation is, is very strict because the standards that they're imposing on uh, creation of bicycle lanes is uh, very high for uh, for other cities to, to comply. I think it's uh, European standards. <laughs> so that part also has to be taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Veron. It looks like there's a lot of uh, interesting work that can be done together with Serge and Kirsten. <laughs> Uh, around that in the, in the Philippines. Um, and uh, Pradeep, would you like to respond yeah. on EVs as well? Actually, uh, we are trying to promote uh, solar uh, electric buses uh, in Lalipur, but the government of Nepal this year has increased the taxation on electrical vehicles. Why they are against, uh, we, we still not understood the government strategy on electrical vehicles, but but still, uh, it is uh, very expensive in Kathmandu, so it is uh, somehow difficult for us. Uh, but uh, uh, in Lalipur, in the Kathmandu Valley, we are going to establish uh, uh, 13, in 13 places a uh, recharge station uh, so that the people, we can encourage the people. And uh, with Sasa Yatayat uh, of one of the transportation private sector, uh, we have invested uh, 25 million Nepalese rupees for to uh, procure uh, this uh, bus electrical buses and for the tourist area also we are uh, we have uh, uh, trying to purchase for uh, electrical uh, vehicles but uh, uh, because of this uh, covid uh, we have uh, 
we are still not clear on this part but still uh, we are promoting electrical vehicles uh, because it is uh, uh, because in nepal in, in nepal's uh, electricity is the high potential of electricity is there so uh, better we uh, we can we buy fossils it is a uh, somewhat expensive so we are trying to promote in this part and uh, some of the solar lights are been already established in lalitpur in this way some uh, somehow we are trying to uh, encourage the people to use uh, electrical vehicles. Uh, already, our mayor had already purchased one electrical vehicle, uh, so he used to he is using uh, electrical vehicles. But still, uh, because of lack of uh, rules and regulation is there, we cannot uh, we couldn't uh, promote electrical vehicles this time. That sounds great, Pradeep. Um... I, I think uh, here we see some of the need for vertical integration between national government and uh, local government planning, and uh, I think this is a this is an issue that uh, that um, that is important. Yeah. One thing I want to add: Nepal Nepal has a three types of government: central level, provincial, and uh, local level. And provincial level, uh, our uh, Bagmati pro province is there. They have already. Uh, in the process of procure uh, 540 uh, electrical buses mm -hmm. this this is your strategy but uh, but uh, uh, like you mentioned we have uh, some uh, somehow uh, no coordination among the uh, this state's government that is uh, that is true yeah and 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 one last question for for serge as we uh, just before wrapping up um so um from the audience, which of the urban design principles pr that you presented can be best uh, can can be applied in informal settlements to improve quality of life and reduce vulnerability to disease? No, that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's a super question. Uh, <laughs> basically, um, you, you you need to. Uh, the, 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 one of the problems of informal settlement that was uh, highlighted by Veronica is the uh, uh, it's the overcrowding basically, uh, which shouldn't be confused with density. You know, if we make uh, this is a real or false uh, debate about the debate about density, uh, because if you make the real correlation, the real correlation is not between density and COVID prevalence, is between poverty and COVID prevalence. If you look at cities like uh, New York and uh, uh, the, the rate of death is high in Bronx uh, uh, or in uh, the South uh, uh, Brooklyn, but it's not, it's not uh, high in Brooklyn Heights or in Manhattan. So uh, and uh, neighborhoods. So to come back to your to your real question, one of the problems, yeah, but I'm I'm linking the the two things uh, that Veronica has been highlighting uh, is the prevalence of uh, uh, COVID uh, in uh, areas with informal informality and not just informality. It's just about uh, hygiene, access to uh, access to to clean water. But sometimes it's very practical. It's just the possibility to wash your hands and to find gel and to not to share toilets and 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 and, and all these type of things. So I think in informal settlements, uh, you have first this issue of overcrowding. Uh, you have this, uh, the land, uh, it's not just like, you, you, you cannot just uh, settle the issues uh, it, by, by looking, uh, I'm sorry to tell that, but just at the informal settlement itself. Uh, an example is India. Uh, India, you have, uh, um, in Mumbai, you have uh, uh, 8 million people uh, living at uh, densities of 1, uh, 160,000 people per square kilometer on average and uh, the peak areas, you have half a million people per square kilometer. So you're not just going to improve anything. Uh, you just need uh, to provide land for these people to uh, not, not, it doesn't mean eradicate the, uh, uh, the informal settlement. It just means uh, to relax the overcrowding pressure. I don't know in the Philippines, but in India, it's, it's really, it's really, uh, it's not just informality, it's really overcrowding. And so you cannot provide, you just have five square meters per people to provide for housing, schools, public space, and streets. So how can you going to provide anything? So you need, you need to look at the density and to look for a sustainable density. 
and uh, a sustainable density is 15,000 people per square kilometer. It's not 10 times this. Uh, and uh, if it is 10 times this, you cannot do anything. So you need to provide land for these people, uh, not push these people away, but provide opportunities, provide jobs, provide the possibility uh, uh, to build when it is too much overcrowded. And then you could start to work uh, in a quite subtle way, not, not wiping out everything, but uh, restructuring the uh, uh, public space. And also something you, you just have, usually UN Habitat considers that you need to have a 10%, 50% uh, built space and 50% open space, parks, streets, and 30% and, and, and connective uh, uh, streets. In informal settlements, you have five to eight percent connective streets, so uh, and you don't have parks. So at some point, you need to create that, uh, and you, you need to create that not by destroying the houses of people, but that's exactly the way the the the, uh, the European cities have evolved. When they were too crowded, uh, they were relaxing the pressure uh, and then uh, opening space for uh, creating a, a, a structure. With, uh, with public space. So that's, that's a lot of work. And at the moment, if you just look at uh, a settlement itself, you may think uh, you, you, you don't have space for doing anything. If you look at, 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 at the wall city or at the wall situation of the informal settlements, like my experience in Mumbai, uh, you just figure out that it cannot work. It cannot simply work. There, there is not, they need 1000 square kilometers 1,000 square kilometers more uh, expansion of the city. And it's not about sprawl. It's just about providing the minimum, you know, something like uh, 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 French uh, people in Paris, they have 60 uh, uh, square kilometers, uh, no, 60, uh, no, six, mm, sorry. They have, uh, they have, no, 60, 60 square meters, 60 square meters, not square kilometers, 60 square meters per person for housing and public space. That's that the average. In the US, it's uh, uh, something like uh, uh, four to five times uh, this in, in, in the average US in, in California uh, per people uh, with the green space, with the highways, with, uh, with everything. And in informal settlement in Mumbai, they have 10 times less than Paris and 50 times less than, than, than in the US. So uh, before uh, implementing uh, good planning and good design, you need to solve the land, uh, the land issue, which is, which is really prevalent. It's, it's overcrowded because there is not enough land and it has not been uh, also planned in advance. Uh, in a sense, you should provide land for these people, which have a minimum uh, sewage, uh, water, uh, facilities, infrastructure. So when people, they can, they can build their own house, it's not a problem. And the house can be uh, shabby, whatever, but it would be built in a more uh, wealthy, uh, ordered uh, uh, organization. And, and, and people are, and, and also, and some of the principles of urban planning and design, you should provide jobs nearby. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, uh, uh, this is just people, uh, I, I, I don't know in the Philippines, but in, in, in uh, what's happening in South Africa, uh, uh, the government provides housing far away from everything, from public transportation and from jobs. So people take the government housing and then they live in an informal settlement close to the, to the job. So uh, it's, there, is, there is an issue of scale but it's it's a case where if you uh, you need to work at the two scales, uh, yeah. you're not going to to solve everything uh, just at the scale of the neighborhood in the informal settlement. Yeah, you can absolutely. But, but you, you you need the informal settlement exists because there is uh, uh, the city itself is totally dysfunctional in terms of offering land to poor people, in terms of offering access to jobs to poor people, in terms of offering. Uh, uh, basic services to poor people. So once you, you start to improve this at city scale, you can you, you, it leaves room for uh, in, locally improving the informal settlement itself. But if you don't, if the city is unable to provide land, access to jobs and basic infrastructure to poor people, you're not going to solve this uh, uh, just at the, at, at the local scale with, with the people. You, you need to work yeah. at the two. Yeah, no, uh, you're absolutely right, Serge. Um, 
I think I think that's I think we we should close with that thought that the idea that we need to actually think about our base resources uh, such as land, water, you know, and uh, see how we can um, distribute it in a way that uh, cares for the the population in general. Um, I think. I think that is the core of uh, the neighborhood approach that we are thinking of. Um, we would like to, um, uh, Andre, can you please show the, the website? So uh, UNEP is developing integrated guidelines for sustainable neighborhood design. And this is a website that will be launched in September. So please keep your eye out for that. Um, the, the website basically gives, um, tries to empower uh, local communities. Uh, it's based on a much uh, longer, there's a much longer technical uh, book essentially behind it, uh, which is authored by Serge, uh, um, but uh, and, and it's a collaboration with other cities that we are working with, such as Lalitpur, uh, such as the um, many cities in the Philippines, such as uh, uh, Renka in Chile, um, we will be collaborating, we have collaborated with eco city builders in Cusco, in Peru, and in uh, Sao Paulo, in Brazil. Um, so these are, these are, uh, Medellin, sorry, um, before I forget. So these are the things that we would like to uh, look at. How can we as people Think about the things that we discussed today, the connection, uh, connection with nature, uh, vertical integration, how, how do we access and understand policies at the national lo level and make them work for us? How can we, um, how can we uh, ensure that uh, we are co-creating with government um, in our own way? And of course, as Serge said, Although this is important, a lot of the lobbying and the leadership at the top level, which is what Veronica said, is equally necessary. So at that, um, let me just end on that note that people ask me all the time, what's the best way they can, they can contribute to, to the environment? And I always respond by saying, vote for people who care about the environment, because that's where a lot of the policies can happen. Um, and I end with that note and uh, thank you. A round of applause, virtual round of applause to our speakers. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for uh, taking the time to join us. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Pradeep, Veron, and Serge. And thank you, of course, to Kami and um, Andre for, the, for taking care of the logistics. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I will find here back is still. Okay. So I can milk business of electric corn on the path house, and I don't know. Common sense and grounds, eh?